Hello everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it seems as if it is a mix of a slimy and even Shelly friend of ours, because we are covering the oh-so-wonderful cone snail. This, of course, is a very special listener episode dedicated to Max. Max is seven years old and sent in this awesome suggestion with an equally awesome drawing that he made along with some facts. Thank you, Max, for sending in your suggestion in such an awesome way. And I have to tell you that you are already light years ahead of my own drawing capabilities, so you can give yourself a big pat on the back. If you would like to request an animal to learn about on the podcast, be sure to send in your animal requests, and you can do so in one of four ways. The first and most popular is by sending your suggestions to Relax With Animal Facts on Instagram. You can also send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. Thirdly, you can always submit your suggestion via the podcast website, relaxwithanimalfacts.com. That gets sent to my email as well. And lastly, you can always request your animal via carrier pigeon. I have gotten many emails asking if their carrier pigeon has arrived yet. And while they have not yet arrived, please keep in mind that the turbulence here in Canada can be quite unforgiving, but I'll be sure to send it right back on its way. All reviews and funny stories from you guys will be at the end of today's episode. I am just going to say where I got my facts from. For this episode, I got my facts from nationalgeographic.com and kidadl.com. This episode would not have been possible without the writings of these two websites. And now I would like for all of you to notice perhaps where you are carrying some tension. Is it in the head? Is it in the shoulders? Maybe the hands? Everybody really is different. For me, in my case, it seems as though today it is mostly in my arms and in my hands, so I am going to do my best to try to relax those parts of my body, and I encourage all of you to relax right alongside me as we go into this immersive experience with me, Steph Wolf, into the warm tropical waters of our world's oceans. I unfortunately could not play the sound that this animal makes. I think you can all understand why. So we will have to move into what exactly is a cone snail. These amazing creatures can be found in the warm tropical regions of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean but it can also be found on the coasts of the United States of America. Many of us are familiar with this cone-shaped shell that the cone snail has. I do not think that the majority of people, me included, prior to this episode, know that the cone snail 
is venomous and its venom is known as something as a conotoxin. The cone snail that is most notorious for this is known as the geographic cone. And among the hundreds of species of cone snail, the geographic cone has the strongest. These critters have a harpoon-like tooth that they can shoot out to hunt prey and bring swift destruction to anything within seconds. These critters have a harpoon-like tooth that they are able to shoot out to hunt prey and bring swift destruction to it within a few seconds. However, most species are not going to be deadly to humans because of weak toxins. But let us take a little bit of a detour and look around on the seafloor to see if we can see just a little more about this geographic cone. Let us remember that the geographic cone is the most deadly of the near 500 species of cone snail and has a very uniquely patterned shell. It is, of course, an invertebrate. It is a carnivore and it is going to be about the size of a regular teacup from four to six inches in length. The incredibly toxic venom of the geographic cone snail is strong enough to paralyze instantly and sort of has to be because otherwise the fish that it preys on would swim away just to die and this slow-moving gastropod is not exactly going to be the fastest swimmer and so would exert its energy for none of the reward. But what I find interesting about the geographic cone snail is that among the compounds that are found in cone snail venom in general, are proteins which, when they are isolated, have enormous potential as a painkiller. Research shows that certain of these proteins target specific human receptors and can be up to 10,000 times more potent than morphine without morphine's addictive properties and side effects. This is a sort of ironic contribution to medicine as the cone snail uses its venom for destruction and death of its prey, but researchers of course find that within this very toxic compound is something that can be of tremendous benefit as a painkiller. So apart from the geographic cone snail or the geography cone, there are nearly 500 other species. Some sources say even more than that. So let us just zoom a little bit back out to look at the cone snail as a whole. They are going to prey on fish, marine worms, and other sea snails. There are other snails in the sea, but the town is not big enough for the both of them, and so they are going to be looking around to strike with this little harpoon-like tooth at any chance they get if they find another sea snail. This is what makes them carnivorous. They are going to be eating animal material exclusively. They do not like their veggies and so will prefer this kind of pescatarian diet given the environment that they're in. That term gastropod that I used earlier is its class. So I do not just want to say gastropod off the cuff as if everybody knows what I am referring to. Animals are classified into different taxonomic categories, some of them being K, 
kingdoms and classes. The kingdom of this animal, for example, is Animalia, while the class is Gastropoda. And the gastropod class, as a general class, is going to include things like snails and other sea slugs. These taxonomic systems are really going to help researchers get a handle on all of these kinds of species out walking about in the animal kingdom. Without these general categories to put animals in, we would be left scratching our heads as to what is what and which animal we are referring to. So now let us move on to some interesting facts of the cone snail. The first one being how many cone snails are there in the world? We do not as of yet have any definite data about the population of this creature and seeing that there is not even a fully adopted consensus as to how many species there are. Some websites have said 500, some have even gone up to nearly 900 species. It is difficult to say exactly how many there are in the world. It is a lot easier to get data of animals that are terrestrial, meaning living on the land rather than in the seas and in the waters. And in the case of the cone snail, but I hope there are a lot of them far away from where my feet can touch. And let us talk just a little bit more specifically as to where they live. We said at the top of the show that the cone snail is going to inhabit those very warm tropical waters in the Indian and Pacific Ocean, and that is certainly true, but let us talk a little bit more specifically. A lot of species have been found in the western Indo-Pacific region, and snail cone species have also been found in South Africa's Cape region. Scientists could also find a number of species that were living in Southern California, leading to the discovery of the very creatively named Californiconus californicus. Just try to say that one five to ten times fast. It seems to me that sometimes researchers are just pulling somebody's leg when they name creatures like this. The cone snail is most oftentimes a solitary species that lives by hiding under the sand or even rocks. And even though the creature may hunt and eat alone, you are still going to be able to find other cone snails around it. And they will be roaming the sea floors for some time relative to their size, having a long lifespan of around 10 to 20 years, though this is not entirely conclusive because they do not have much information or documentation of their lifespans in the wild. And when the cone snail has offspring, it is not just two, four, five, or six. It is going to be between 1,000 to 5,000 eggs laid at one time. Anyone who grew up as a middle child in between an oldest and youngest sibling will greatly resonate with the 4,998 middle children of the cone snail. At the wide end of the cone snail's body, you will find spires or whorls of various heights, and some cone snail species have a shiny body, while others are going to have more of a dull or plain look. Now coming to its teeth, it is contained inside what is known as the radula, 
This is an anatomical teeth-like structure for feeding in mollusks, which will help them to chew their food, a process known as mechanical digestion. Seeing that we could not play what this animal sounds like at the top of the show, which would have been just a silent sound because they do not make much noise, we have really no idea if or how communication happens in these animals, whether it is even present between their species. But what we do know is that it does have receptors that are chemical receptors that will help it to search and then communicate in the one way that it knows best by bringing death upon its prey does not sound like the best of friends. Now, when its chemical receptors are saying, go this way, there is some prey in this direction, we might even wonder to ourselves, how fast can a cone snail move? These snails can indeed quickly sting an opponent, but as their name suggests, and as we may have guessed, they are not the best at moving quickly and will fall into that category of being some of the slowest marine species our oceans have to offer. We said earlier that the cone snail is going to be about the size of a teacup, but the weight of cone snails may vary according to the exact size of their shell but the average range is thought to be up to 3.5 ounces, which is about 100 grams. So they are not the heaviest creatures that we can pick up, but will still be of an impressive size relative to its weight. We know that dogs, when they are small and baby-like, we call them pups or puppies, we know bears, when they are young, are cubs. So what do we call a baby cone snail? There are really two types of cone snail babies, one of them being the veliger or the free-swimming larvae, and the other one is a veliconca. And the veliconca are the ones that look most like little baby snails. We do not have many cute names to attribute to these deadly baby snails, but it is still cool nonetheless. When this creature is going to hunt and find fish, it is going to be hunting primarily during the night, which is going to mean that they are nocturnal creatures. And what is going to happen during the night time, during their hunting process, is going to be one that is a good strategy. We found out earlier that the cone snail is not exactly the cheetah of the sea, and so it is going to have to really find a way to hunt smart, and so it does. It will often wait on the surface and wait for the prey to arrive, perhaps looking like just a beautiful little seashell or rock on the sea floor. But once that prey gets close enough for the alarm bells of their chemical receptors to start ringing, it is going to sting its prey in that harpoon-like manner that we spoke about in some species. However, the system of eating is a bit different as the cone shells will prefer to gulp down the kill as soon as possible without using the sting as a first move. These are snails that somebody does not want to mess with. This venom, as we spoke about before, is very deadly and can even seriously harm a human being. 
And for the final fact of the episode, let us cover why the cone snail is called the cone snail. The common name that we have been referring to this animal throughout this episode, the cone snail, they have shells that more or less look to be conical in shape, making for that very easy visual distinction when you first see them. I believe the majority of people, including myself, are very happy with this name. It is pretty accurate, and some of us likely would have come up with a similar name had we been given the microphone. And now, as we are down here swimming with the cone snails, though not getting too close, I am going to read a review from a very special listener named Dre9797, who wrote in all the way from the United States of America, which, remember, has the cone snail. And Dre9797 writes, I have anxiety and can lie awake all night just thinking. I've tried meditation and I've tried a lot of podcasts, but I'm very picky. This podcast has been a miracle. Finding it and listening to it at night brings me such joy. It's so soothing that I feel like I'm falling asleep with a smile on my face. I absolutely love animals, but in all honesty, I have found my favorite parts of this podcast is the creator Steph Wolf. Steph is incredibly genuine and it's incredibly comforting. It feels like such a safe place. I feel like I get to not only learn about furry, scaly, and even slimy friends, but also a new friend. Someone that cares about my day and my opinions. Everything about this podcast is five stars. I have had the most mental rest and joy while listening to this podcast. I used to make it through the entire episode and fall asleep easily after. Over time, I have begun falling asleep during the episodes. So now, I set a timer for myself and go through about half an episode a night, and I highly recommend this podcast. Thank you, Dre9797. There are so many kind words in that review that I would not even know where to start in replying to it. But dear friend Dre, thank you for leaving that review. I am so glad that you found the show and that you enjoy listening to it every night and sometimes can even make it halfway. Let me move on to an email that I got from a listener named Ellie who wrote into the show with the subject line, A Glitch in the Matrix. And Ellie writes, You're not gonna believe this. As I'm listening to the latest Zebra episode, I am sitting in the Starbucks drive through and you spell Equus, which is spelled E-Q-U-U-S, and I look up and see it on the car right in front of me. What are the odds? By the way, Ellie included a little picture of a car with this little Equus distinction on the back of it. But Ellie continues writing, I love your podcast. It keeps my mind occupied while I work. Much appreciated and keep up the good work. Feel free to share this if it comes up in the rambling portion of the podcast. And of course, here it is on the rambling portion of this podcast. 
those glitches in the matrix, as Ellie referred to it, can be very funny. And you can all imagine that you're driving somewhere or, like Ellie, stuck in a Starbucks drive through while everyone in front of you is getting a latte with more names and harder to pronounce than some of the scientific names on the show, such as the Venti Frappuccinicus and the Vanilla Macchiaticus. But you can all imagine that I am spelling out something as you are looking at it in real life. And Ellie made sure to send in this funny story. If any of you have any funny stories with your animals or with other furry, scaly, slimy friends. Or even some funny story to do with the podcast make sure to write in to be included in this portion of the episodes and so I can interact with all of you. If you would like to continue this episode, we do exclusive episode continuations on the Patreon page, Relax with Animal Facts. All of the links that are relevant to this are in the description of the episode on the website or anywhere you can look online. There are already three or four episodes ready, hot off the presses for you to listen to, and even some audio blogs, and I look forward to seeing you guys there. Thank you all for listening to the Relax with Animal Facts show. I hope to see you on the very next episode with the next animal. Take care.